know your IS code provisions short lecture series. So in this lecture, I will explain about torsion, that is IS 1893 clause number 7.8 torsion. So three questions. One is what is torsion, when it will occur, and what are the safeguards against torsion given in the code? So what is torsion? Torsion is twisting of building about its vertical axis is called torsion. Now, when it will occur? It will occur when the center of mass and center of resistance of the building doesn't coincide. Then torsion occurs. Now, what are the safeguards against that? Let's go into the details. Let me share my screen. So clause number 7.8, torsion. So what code says is, provision shall be made in all buildings for increase in shear forces on the lateral force resisting elements resulting from twisting about the vertical axis of the building arising due to eccentricity between center of mass and center of resistance at the floor levels. So important uh, statements from this uh, paragraph or from this clause is, one is increase in shear forces on the lateral force resisting element, that is number one. Why it will increase? Because of the eccentricity, bit, eccentricity between center of mass and center of resistance at each floor level. Now, the design forces calculated as in 7.6 and 7.7.5, shall be applied at displaced center of mass so as to cause design eccentricity between the displaced center of mass and center of resistance. So that is what, so base shear which is computed and the vertical distribution of the base shear. So usually this uh, vertical distribution, that means at story level force, uh, it will act at the diaphragm level. So that will act at center of mass. When there is eccentricity, then it will twist. So how to compute this eccentricity and how to uh, compute the additional forces which are arising due to this eccentricity. Let's look into that. Design eccentricity. While performing structural analysis by the seismic coefficient method or response spectrum method, the design eccentricity EDI to be used at floor I shall be taken as 1.5 times ESI. ESI is static eccentricity plus 0 0.05 bi. So b is the width of the floor at that level, at, the, at that floor level. And then next equation is ESI minus 0 0.05 bi. So compute design eccentricity by these two equations and take the more severe effect, whichever is giving more severe effect that should be taken into consideration while design. Now let's look into the details. What is static eccentricity? Static eccentricity is the distance between center of mass and center of resistance. So if the mass is distributed evenly on any floor, geometric center will become center of mass. Usually that is not the case, but we can compute center of mass and center of stiffness both. Then BI is floor plan dimension of the floor I, perpendicular to the direction of the force. Now the point is, why 1.5 is used. So this factor 1.5 represents a dynamic amplification factor and 0 0.05 bi represents the extent of accidental eccentricity. So one is, this is equivalent. So we are converting the dynamic effect into static effects. So that's why this 1.5 factor is dynamic amplification factor multiplied by static eccentricity value. And then in addition to that, we will, uh, we will add this accidental eccentricity of 5% because say functional utility of the building might change uh, uh, over a period of time. Also, it might happen that there may be errors in computing say center of mass. So for that reason, 5% of the uh, floor, that floor plan dimension is taken into consideration. Then 
this 1.5 factor need not be used when we are performing dynamic analysis using time steel. Now, there are two cases. One is if center of mass and center of uh, stiffness or center of resistance coincide. So this is an ideal case. So if center of mass, center of resistance coincide, what happens? So let's look at this uh, diaphragm. And uh, there are, say, uh, five frames along y direction. And whose stiffnesses are given, uh, like k1 up to k5. And three frames along x direction, that is k6, k7, and k8. So in this one, center of mass and center of resistance, both are lying at the same location. And if we apply, say, that is diaphragm level force, that is QI, at any floor, whichever floor it is. So the force which is resisted by a particular frame depends on its relative stiffness. So that is, say, F1, if we want to compute, that is equal to K1 divided by sigma K multiplied by Q. So like that, like that we can compute uh, forces along uh, forces along each frames at that level. So maybe x direction we can compute, y direction we can compute depending on the force. Now the case is if this if the center of mass or center of resistance and center of mass are not uh, coinciding. So that means what there is some eccentricity. That is dynamic eccentricity is there. So uh, Q, which is the story level force acting at a design eccentricity distance from center of resistance. Say, uh, this has to be done in two directions, but I'm explaining here one direction. So like how the forces can be computed, how the force uh, acting on each frame and also additional force due to this design eccentricity. Let's look at this uh, uh, frame, Let, uh, look at this uh, floor. So center of resistance is given and at a design eccentricity distance, uh, this force Q is acting. Now, this force Q is transferred to center of resistance location by converting the same force into uh, Q as well as the torsion. That is torsion force is equal to Q multiplied by design eccentricity, which is lever arm. Now there are two forces here. So now this uh, Q will produce pure translation because the force is acting at center of resistance. And we can compute that uh, pure translation force that uh, on any frame by its uh, relative stiffness. But how do we compute the forces which are arising due to this torsion? Let's, let's look into the details. Now, again, the, again, the uh, floor plan. And let's take one typical uh, uh, frame whose stiffness is K1. And this is at a distance of R1, at a radius of R1 from the center of resistance, Okay, where this torsion is acting, which is in anti-clockwise direction. So because of this torsion, the entire floor diaphragm will twist or rotate by an angle theta, rotate by an angle theta, which will displace the uh, uh, frame by value delta. So delta can be computed by theta and r. So theta multiplied by r1, we can get delta. That is the displacement of this frame whose stiffness is k1. Now we can compute with this delta the force which uh, is acting on, uh, on the frame uh, f1 frame one. So delta force F1 is equal to K1 multiplied by theta multiplied by R1. That is the force due to uh, frame displacement. And because it is acting at a lever arm of uh, R1, we can compute the moment. So delta M is equal to K1 multiplied by theta multiplied by R1, which is delta F multiplied by R, we get delta M. So if we uh, total all the uh, moments arising due to rotation and resistance due to all from the, all the frames, we get this total moment. That is a summation of all the moments uh, due to frames. Now this moment, this total moment should be equal to uh, the torsion, which is arising due to eccentricity. And if we equate these two, and we can uh, take out this uh, uh, theta out, then we get the theta value. So that is torsion divided by sigma k1 r1 square or ki ri square, we get theta. Then delta fi can be computed. So the total force 
the or the additional force and plus total force so additional force which is occurring uh, causing uh, additional force which is uh, coming on to frame due to design eccentricity is delta f1 and f1 is due to uh, q so this is the total force so this is how uh, additional forces are computed due to torsion so the intention of this short lecture is to help uh, students and practicing engineers understand is code provisions in a better manner and following references i have used for the preparation of this uh, lecture and i sincerely acknowledge the help of my students in preparation of this uh, short lecture so thank you